So welcome to idea from idea to book, and um, we're trying to um, we're offering these. Um, uh, I don't know every semester, every couple of semesters, and and, and Michael did one. Um, I believe it was last in the summer, right? And um, so that y to really um, give you a, a sense of process, since um, that's what we're working in here um, during your four semesters. And um, I think it's really um, useful for you to get um, a more detailed sort of inside look into the process that um, a writer's gone through in producing a book. Um, and each book is really different, I'll tell you that. Um, even for, in, in my case, e the process of writing each one of my books was different. And, and then my process, of course, would be very different from um, Michael's or from Bill's or Rachel's or, or any of your process. So, it, so that's why it's good to hear this kind of thing from more than one person and hear about more than one book. There's a lot that, that you can learn. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, Centerville. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to start off with kind of the conception um, I'm going to talk about the, you know, the actual writing of it, and and I did some research, which I'll talk about too, and um, and I'm also going to talk about. I did a little reflecting on this. I'm also going to talk about um, some of the obstacles that I ran up against and some of the difficulties that I had, and then I'll talk about the um, publication process, which was uh, sort of interesting because I worked with a couple different editors on it as as it ended up at very different houses. Um, and and then um, I'll talk for a while, and then I'll um, we'll do a I'll ask if there are any questions, and I'm happy to do a um, Q and A, or I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so this is a book that started off um, quite differently it was than my other novels, and um, in that it it's based on something that actually happened, even though it's very fictionalized. And so I tend to write about things that are completely different than, than what I experience in my own life. So that's how it was really different for me, and, um, or a departure. And um, when, so I'll tell you what the incident was first, and then how I ended up writing about it. So the incident occurred when I was about 10 years old, and we had just moved to this um, we had left this island that I had grown up on, and we had moved to this little town in Ohio. All right, so we had just moved to this little town in Ohio, and I had this uh, girl that I became friends with um, quickly, and her father was, um, as it turned out, was a pharmacist in this little drugstore. And so that's where everybody would go, like if you were a kid that age, you go, and, they, and her father, we'd get free sodas if we went there, which was at the soda fountain, which was this big deal. and. Um, and so this was in, in the late 1960s, um, and um, it's 69. So anyway, what ended up happening was uh, we were going, it was a really hot day in the summer, and we were going down there. We walked downtown, and we walked up to the drug, door of the drugstore, and similar to um, the Sandy in, in my um, novel, and this is the, uh, there are a couple things in there that are based on my memory, and that's one of them. I um, put my hand on this door and backed away from it. And I had no clue why I had done that, but I just knew I wasn't going in that store. And so, um, and she was kind of mad at me because I wasn't going in the store. And instead we went down the um, uh, street to this bowling alley where a bunch of kids were hanging out, including our brothers and, and some other friends. Mm -hmm. About um, five minutes uh, after walking in there, maybe 10 minutes, there was this big uh, boom that sounded like thunder, and we walked out, and the drugstore was a five-story building, and it was completely in flames. And um, both her, her father and, and her brother was in there, too, so her, she and her brother both went running into these flames. And the flames just really quickly engulfed the couple of buildings that were next to it, so it was this enormous fire. And the, um, and the town did not have the resources to put it out right away, and so it spread and spread very quickly. And it, uh, there was a paint store near it, and it hit a paint store, and that exploded. And so it was this enormous fire that lasted the rest of the day. It started 
you know, right around lunchtime, and it went all, went into the dark. And um, and so just as a kid, I was just running through this. I mean, I was in this, yeah, you know, running through the fire trying to find her, and there weren't any. It was just kind of chaos. So there wasn't, uh, you know, there were, weren't. So and my mother didn't know. Uh, my mother knew that I was down. She thought I was in the drugstore. My brother was. But anyway, and they, my parents didn't find us for a long time until like I think in the evening. So it was this, this long day. And so this happened, and it's not like as a kid, I was young enough that it wasn't like it was real, I don't remember it like being, like I remember it being like uh, scary and all that, or kind of overwhelming, but I don't remember it being like really traumatic or anything like that. It's not something that I thought about a lot as I grew up, like, oh, I had this trauma, or I, you know, I didn't, I just kind of put it out of my mind, which I think is kind of a kid's reaction often. You know, I didn't really understand it, so I just sort of stopped thinking about it, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, I hadn't thought about it in years as an adult, but I will say that as an adult, what happened, and this was sort of the trigger for the book, is that once I had kids, I started having this dream every now and then, and the dream was always that I was in the, that I was walking through this fire, and there were these little bits of fire everywhere, you know, these piece puddles of fire. And in the dream, I was always looking for my kids. It was like, one of my kids is in this fire, I have to find them. And it wasn't a nightmare, really, but I remember sometimes waking up and thinking, oh, it's like I've been to hell, you know? It's like I was walking around in hell or something. Like, what is this? And so um, I had this dream once, and you know how sometimes like you're having a dream and then the dream starts talking to you? So like, how, like I'm having this dream and the dream is like saying, you're the one in the fire. <laughs> like, like it's a big message. And so <laughs> I woke up and I went, oh yeah, I was the one in the fire. Like, like I was the kid who got lost in the fire. And so I, at that, I got up and I was going to write, I was working on something different at the time. But I got up and just off the top of my head, I wrote out the scene of me being in the, of me being in the drugstore. Because it kind of came back in a flash, like, oh, I was almost in that drugstore. And so I wrote out the scene as if I was in the drugstore. And so that's the prologue that, in the book. And I wrote that out pretty much verbatim of how it is in the book. I mean, I made some, it doesn't, isn't like, I did revise it, but I didn't make any huge changes after I wrote it. And I wrote it in kind of a burst of, of imagery. I had the images in my head, so I just wrote it all. And, um, you know, I wrote it like in an hour or something. And, um, and, and it's certainly in just a short morning. And then I put it away. And I, because I didn't know what, I, I didn't know if I was going to do anything with it. I couldn't think, it didn't occur to me that it could be a novel or that, I didn't know what it was. And then uh, I didn't think about it really. I just kind of put it aside, didn't really look at it for about six months or maybe even closer to a year. And then I happened to be, and my parents, uh, I was helping them go through stuff in the attic. And I came across this box that had all this stuff in it from when I was a kid. And it was all my stuff. And it had this little journal. It was like my first little diary, you know. So I'm opening that up and reading it. And all the page entries are really short. Like, I have these entries like, we got a puppy, <laughs> you know? And it's like three pages later, they're completely blank where I wrote nothing in it. And then it'll be like, well, I went to the pool today. <laughs> I just do it. So I'm reading, so I was not real, um, a real big writer or anything in that age, I guess. And then all of a sudden, I come to this entry for the date when this fire had occurred. And it's like, I've got six pages, you know, of my bad handwriting that I filled. And then what was interesting to me was then the next day after that, what I did in my diary is I wrote out this list of questions that I had about that fire. And it was this interesting list of questions to me because I realized reading it as an adult that I still had those same questions. You know, like one of them was, why would somebody do this? You know, it's a question that you would still ask as an adult. Like, oh, well, I still have no clue why someone would do that. And how does something like, you know, like, why does that happen? And, and, and how come I didn't walk in that store? And how come so-and-so did walk in the store? And so I had these questions. And, you know, as I was trying to say last night, like, uh, uh, often I'm um, motivated in my writing by questions. So, um, so I started then to um, write 
more, all of a sudden, what I could see then, it just kind of came to me like a flash, I could see that there would be these four characters and that they would be, you know, kind of circling this fire and that they would, and that, that somehow or another my questions would be, you know, that I still had would be generating this, this action. And so, uh, so the book came out of initially those questions. And in particular, in, 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 as I say, one of those questions was like, who would do this? So I kept in the real story. So I went back and I talked to my mom, you know, my parents, and they said, oh yeah, the guy who, who blew up the drugstore, he ended up getting killed in the fire. That was the real story. But I decided well, I was going to leave him alive so that he, I could answer my question, right? I was going to get to the bottom of this guy. That's my idea. And, um, and so, um, and so uh, I wrote the whole first uh, 125 pages probably. Uh, pretty quickly, I want to say for me, pretty quickly, like in a few months I wrote that. And then I had the major pieces in place of all that. And a lot of the stuff kind of came to me really uh, kind of in a flash after reading those questions. Like I could see Elizabeth and I, could, and I knew that she was going to make this. I guess I'm really fascinated with hobbies and the way in which a hobby can come, become an obsession. And so I, I don't know if that's why that came to me that way, but the building of that mosaic on the wall, how that kind of gets out of control, that was something that, um, that I saw uh, sort of immediately with her. Um, and um, the character of the policeman was probably the most problematic initially because, you know, anytime I think you have a type, you know, he's, then that's, you, you want to, it's hard, hard to make them individual, you know, so it's not, this, don't become a caricature or stereotype at all. So I think I maybe initially I remember he was a little bit evasive. But at any rate, I wrote these first 125 pages pretty quickly. And the thing that generated it, I think, for me and made it easy for me to write is that I had this, they were all moving around the fire, you know? So I had the fire in the center, and then all these characters are circling the fire. And to me, the energy of that felt sort of like this vortex or spiral, and I could just, it, it just gave me a lot of momentum. So then I got to the end of that, and, um, and I was talking to my agent at the time, and she said, um, oh, yeah, send it to me. You know, even though it's not finished, send it to me. So I send it to her, and we have this conversation afterwards, and the first thing she says to me is like, she says, wow, this is really good, I really, really great material. She goes, but what are you going to do now? And I was kind of like, yeah, what am I going to do now? So like, that's the place where I got really stuck, because I didn't have something that was a center anymore. And I had these multiple points of view, so I had these four different points of view, so I needed something to be the center of this story to keep moving it forward, if that makes any sense. At least that's how it felt to me. And I didn't know what that was. And so, you know, I, I sometimes call that like the whole middle of the book, the soggy middle. But like I was like caught in that for a long time and I couldn't figure out how to generate the plot or where it ought to be going. And I had this, George and I knew it had Fowler. I knew it had something to do with him, and so, so it, it was just um, it was just a lot of starts and stops and a lot of dead scenes. And so sometimes I'd write a scene and um, and then I'd go back and look at it and and it wouldn't be alive at all. So when that happens with me, often I know that I've got the wrong thing. Like it's, I have to rethink the event, or I have to rethink where where it's going, or where I'm trying to go with it. So, um, so that was that was the uh, was one of the hard parts. Another hard part was that um, I um, so when I finished it, then when I got a draft a draft of it, I gave it to my agent, and I went down, and we had this conversation, <laughs> and she read it, had read it, and. The, one of the first things she says to me, oh yeah, it's all really great, and it's not quite ready to be sent up, but almost. And she goes, you know what? The, the church needs to blow, needs to explode. The church needs to blow up. <laughs> and I said, well, really? And, and yeah, that was my, my response, really? And so she says, yeah, 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 it needs to, you know, there needs to be this, that needs to be the climax, you know? You've got it 
set up this is perfect opportunity you need to blow up the church so I so uh, okay so she's a really good reader and I love my agent I'd had her for a long time so I thought okay I'm gonna go work on this I'm gonna I'm gonna blow up this church and so or George Power was going to so <laughs> and of course I didn't want to do it for every reason you're thinking I didn't want to do it because like oh my god really it would be totally melodramatic and too expect but anyway I went home and I wrote this I spent a long time on this and I will say that I, I think that that scene of when I blew up that church when I finally got that scene I think it's one of the best scenes I've ever written in my whole life it was just so great when I got it and it was the, the way in which the minister went inside and found this officer and the imagery and the oh it just was so powerful and yet so so anyway it was in there and yet what in, ended up happening of course is that I realized that I couldn't blow up the church <laughs> and that it didn't fit with something that George Fowler would do with what my character would do because that he would that was not something he was interested because I ha hadn't really understood my main character my, my character uh, my killer because that's a question I started with right um, why is somebody who would do this so I still didn't know who he was is what I realized and and the more I got to know him, the more I realized that what he wanted was some sort of easy redemption and, and not to go blow up something else. And so that's why I couldn't use it, even though I, I liked the scene. I had to take it out. And, um, and the other thing that was hard, so two other things that I'll, I'll share with you that were hard. And, and one is that um, oh, I, I really struggled with those scenes in which that George Fowler is in where he's with the minister, like I rewrote that dialogue over and over again, because again, I was having trouble with that character. And initially that character had actual chapters, like the, that character had a bigger voice in the book. And even up at the last minute, this was like sort of right before it was start, sort of going into some final edits and all of that had been taken. And, by a publisher, I, I just wasn't comfortable with the way I with that character, and I just kept thinking, I don't really understand this character. And my and you know, like agents and stuff will say to you things like, well, at least mine do. It was say like, they're into psychology, so they're like, oh, why would he do that? Like, it's not clear. Like, the motives aren't clear. So I was trying to get it. Oh, what are his motives? I still didn't know what his motives were. So I was sort of in my mind, just sort of driving myself crazy with all these questions. And then the neat thing was is I was on the train ride going back from Ender. So I had been here for a residency, right? And so I don't know, there's something about being, you're all thinking about, you know, you know how it is after the residency and your brain's kind of buzzing and you're thinking about all this stuff. And so I'm riding back on a train and, and my brain was really going and I'm thinking, all of a sudden I thought, wow, I just had this real breakthrough. Like the thing was, I wasn't supposed to understand this character. Like this was the the character who was supposed to be complete, who was supposed to be elusive. Like that's reality, right? And in my mind, all of a sudden, I realized like you can't know somebody like that who would do something like blow up a store and kill a lot of people, which he did kill a lot of people. So I um. So I, I reflected. I mean, and one of the things I thought of when I was thinking of all this was you know, story or, or, you know, different novels or stories where this had happened and, and including like Flannery O'Connor's famous story, you know, A uh, Good Man is Hard to Find with a Misfit and how like there's the misfit and, you know, you, you, you don't really, you really don't, um, she doesn't explain him at all. We don't know what his motives are, you know. Anyway, I, I, I related to that, that, that he, he, that my killer had to be elusive in the same way. Um, so that what I ended up doing then was that's how I got all those little, there's a lot of little elliptical passages that are just italicized about the killer. And so that's the only voice that you get of his. And so I intentionally um, made him, I, I, I realized that, that he was not somebody who could be and should or should be explained at all. And so I, I was happier with that. Um, and then the other thing that was hard was, um, predictably maybe, 
is um, Sandy's uh, when she puts her hand on the door. And I think it's partly because that was my experience. You know, I always say this to, to, to students who are writing, I've always said this to students who are writing, if they're writing from something that's actually true, happened, I always say change something really big, change something, at least one thing. But if you only change one thing, it have to be something substantial, something that matters. Because otherwise, then I think you, it's too easy to get stuck inside of trying to be true to something and then your imagination doesn't enter into play. So I um, changed a lot of things, you know, I ch and I changed with Sandy. I didn't want her to be too close to me, so I gave her a very different personality than mine, and I made her, um, and I made her a little older. Um, but still, that scene, which is something I had experienced and hadn't understood, was very hard to write about. So, so I, I, that's another scene that I rewrote over and over again. It was really hard for me to get the, um, the language and the action right, and et cetera. Um, I did a lot of research while I was working on it. I, I tend to re research everything. Um, I read Martin Luther King's sermons, um, which were, were wonderful. Uh, they're beautifully written. I recommend them. Um, I figured that my minister would have read, read some of those, so I read them. And um, I initially, in a draft, the, up until towards the end, I had some lines from his sermons uh, in there. And I, I can't remember why those were taken out now. I think it might have been the rights or something. Anyway, I had to end up taking those out. But they're still, the influence is still there because he has this uh, amazing passage about evil in one of his sermons and, and in which he says, it just really startled me. He has this, it, it's, it's a couple of paragraphs. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's kind of along the lines of, um, Evil's real, which is something I never believed. You know, I didn't believe I didn't believe evil was real until I read that, and it really made me think about it. And it's kind of like, you know, have no question about it. You know, if you have a question about that, you're really naive. It's out there. It's real. Recognize it. And if you don't, you know, you're not. It's kind of like you weren't accepting responsibility or, or seeing clearly. And so I think that had a real influence on um, how I saw uh, George Fowler and um, how the minister, um, what the minister was grappling with. Um, the other things I used for research, um, I read, um, uh, I used the collection of um, Life magazines from that period. It was partly how I decided on the weeks and so I wanted uh, a place did after just uh, just after those riots uh, occurred in um, Detroit and Newark, and there were lots of great pictures of those. I, I recommend the Life magazines if you can get them. I mean, Mount Holyoke was wonderful because they had them bound, and I could sit and actually look at the magazines rather than uh, microfiche or something. But the other thing that you'll get if you look at the at the magazines is you're going to get the all the. Um, uh, you know, the products people were using then, and the types of cars that they were driving, and the, all of that stuff. So that's, so that's, that's really um, useful. Um, let's see, what other kind of research did I do? Oh, I did a lot of small town research, <coughs> drugstores, small town drugstores. And the other thing that I did was I, um, I did this online, and you would be amazed how much you can find. I had to research explosives, right? So how does one build a bomb? And it's amazing. It's, you can find it all out online. <laughs> Are you just visit afterwards? Well, I know. Well, it's funny because my husband came home one night and I said, oh, I said, this is really incredible. You would not believe. You can go online and find out how to build all these bombs, these types of bombs. I've been doing this all day, you know? <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, oh, great. Are you telling me, you know, FBI is going to be at our door tomorrow or something? But um, nothing ever happened because of it. I guess they didn't catch me. <laughs> but, yeah, I researched that. Um, so... Um, Okay, so I guess, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about um, the publication, and then I'll see if you have any questions. How are we doing for time? Um, so this was a really, um, this book went through a lot of strange um, detours. 
uh, some of which some of you know. I think Michael knows some of them. Um, so I had this agent. I had two different agents and two different editors during the course of trying to publish this book. And I had this agent that I had had for all of my books. I'd had her for a long time. I'd had her since Patchwork, and I really, I do still really love her. She's this wonderful woman. She's an incredible reader, a great agent. But what was happening was that um, there were a lot of things, a few things. One, I think she, and she told me this, she had kept me with the same editor for the first three books, which probably was not wise, especially because this editor increasingly was not doing anything with books to you know, make sure that they, it wasn't just me, I guess it was other authors, uh, to make sure that they got sales, or she wasn't getting behind the books. Um, so there was that. And then the other thing was is that she was um, very less available, um, or less, it wasn't sending out stuff as much. And she wasn't, and it wasn't me, just me, it was her, she was struggling, uh, I think she was getting close, you know, feeling like maybe she wanted to retire. And then, and then I didn't know about this at the time, I found out about it later, but she had this huge personal thing that happened. And so she, I had just finished this novel, and she was not in a position to be able to do anything with it. And so I was just going to wait on all that, uh, so I hadn't thought about leaving it. And then I happened to talk to, or communicate with somebody who's a, a really well-known author and who is with William Morris, which is a really big agency. And she said, uh, let me see the novel. So I emailed it to her. And then she, or I mailed it to her. And then she contacted me and said, I love this, blah, blah, blah. I really want my agent to see it. But you have to be ready to switch agents if I show it to him. So it was really kind of a, a hard thing. Um, I don't know if I made right decisions, but I'm not a very, I feel like I've not been, I'm not great uh, with the, um, you know, I found that hard, the whole um, figuring out that end of the career, you know, the agent, editor, marketing, all that. Uh, I think it's it is hard landscape to, to probably to navigate for anyone because um, it's changing so much and it's, you know, hard to know how to make decisions. But at any rate, I had a discussion with her on the phone, a couple of them, and she convinced me that um, what I needed was, she said, what you need is you need somebody who's well positioned. And you need somebody who's going to really do something because, you know, not enough has happened with your earlier books. All right, so I decided I would do that. And uh, I switched over, this agent, other agent. Um, she was great in a way. Um, she uh, worked, had me do some revision, revisions of the book, which worked with me closely on that, which I, I do think. This is a benefit, I think, if an agent will do that with you. I think because, you know, it used to be that editors did that kind of work. They don't anymore, so more agents are. And, um, and so uh, that was very helpful. And then she did send it out a lot. I'm not sure about the, um, I kind of found, I kind of got the sense that she, it was a little bit, I don't know if this is typical of bigger agencies, but it was sort of a little bit, she had tons of contacts, but maybe they weren't. It wasn't as carefully being placed because my old agent would just do it one at a time, and she kind of did it in bigger groups. But at any rate, at, at, at any rate, um, she did eventually sell it, right? Okay, so she she got sold it to this editor at um, found an editor who wanted it to acquire it, and this editor was was with uh, Broadway, which is a, um, a division of Random House, and I had been with. Um, uh, William Morrow, uh, Harper Collins before. So it was a new uh, publisher for me and, and a new editor. And I liked the editor a lot. And she was a, um, she was fairly new, uh, well, she was new to that position, but she'd been in editing for years. And she, I could tell she was really smart and she really got my book. So I was all excited. And so I worked with her on that book. You know how like, so then when the editor took it, she wanted, this, this is as typical, I think, she wanted me to make a bunch of changes. So this, there was this like nine month period where I'm making, uh, working on revisions. And uh, one of the things that she really wanted, and this other person who had sent me to w William Morris had said the same thing, well, I'm not sure about the ending. So she wanted me to do this ending where um, she thought that all, 
all, everything had to be concluded. That's the only way I can describe it. And so she wanted me to write, we talked a lot about it, and was like, okay, I'll write an epilogue, you know, <coughs> 20, 30 years later, and it will show how everything works out. And so I, I had kind of mixed feelings about that, but I wrote it. And I spent a long time on it, it was long. And it animates some other changes to the end in addition. And, um, and I have it, that, and the, San, the minister's giving his, his last sermon, and Sandy goes back to see it, and, uh, and there's a scene between them, and so you get a sense of how things have been resolved. She wanted everything resolved, sort of that sort of ending. Oh, and the other thing was, she felt very strongly about this. We have to see that Elizabeth and Jack get married. And so I was kind of like, when she first said that, I was like, you do? And I, because I thought, well, maybe they wouldn't, but I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, all right, so I wrote that. And I actually really liked, ended up really liking a lot of that. I, I had this scene between the two of them, and they're older. And so... I had finished all that, and the book was ready to, I don't know, there was a meeting on the book and the final stages of things. And in the morning of that meeting, it was, I guess it happened uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, the editor later told me this whole story. Um, they came in and, um, and they um, fired all of the fiction editors in one fell swoop. And she was the second, she was the second I forget what you call it, editor-in-chief or whatever of that division. So she and then the person right above her and then all the fiction editors under them were let go. And they had to um, just be out of there, like they had to pick up, the, get up their stuff together and leave. Mm -hmm. and, and then they dropped the, all the books, including mine, so they just dropped them, I guess. And I don't understand quite, I never, I, I, anyway, it was, it was they were able to do it legally, as it turned out. So, um, and so my agent, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't really, I don't know, I didn't feel like my agent handled that real great, like in terms of how she communicated with me about it. But she did eventually communicate with me about it. I had a hard time reaching her at first. She said that she, she basically what she told me is, is she kind of conveyed to me that now my book was like a hot potato that nobody would want to touch, even though it had been dropped for reasons that had nothing to do with the book. So I was kind of like, okay. And so she said, well, show me your next novel. That was her, her, her um, take on it, eventually. And so I, um, meanwhile, the editor who had, I'd been working with contacted me. And she had gone back to her old job, or job she had once had. And she was uh, editor-in-chief, uh, acquiring editor uh, at uh, Women's Day. Um, oh, wait a minute. What's, what's the other one that's connected to Women's Day? Um, Ladies Home Journal. And so, um, so unfortunately, what that meant for me is that she wasn't going to another house. Because <laughs> she was saying, oh, if I was going to another house, I'd take the book. But she couldn't. So she said, um, oh, that's outrageous that she won't show. She's not even going to try to do anything with that book. And so she's e emailing me all this. Eventually, she calls me. She was upset about it. And then she said, this book is done. It was, you know, you, it needs to come out. Just send it to some small presses. And so she kept a on me about that. I probably wouldn't have done it if she hadn't said, kept saying that to me. But anyway, that's why I sent it out myself to some small presses. My agent, I asked my agent, and she never even responded in an email. I said, you know, you want to send it to some smaller presses to me? And she didn't, didn't email me back. So... Um, so I'm going to be trying to get a new agent. <laughs> I don't know if I can. I think I'll go for one that's a smaller agency this time. And that's kind of the other thing that Lorraine, who's the editor, said to me. In one of her emails, she said, you know, just a little bit of advice. I think you might be better off not having a big agent. You know, like, like yeah, if you're really famous, it's great to have a big agency. But maybe I was getting a little lost in all that. So um, anyway, yeah, I... Um, I sent it, I only sent it out to a few places, I think three places, because it was hard work. <laughs> I didn't have time to, you have to write a letter, and I don't know. I just didn't have time to send it out that much. And I think I also wasn't sure how that would work or if, if it would work. But I'll say that she was right. And, and this, I just want to give this to you as, 
like, um, so you can remember this it's, if, you, if you need it at some point, that if the book is good and the book is ready, it'll find a place. Like she told me that and I was like, oh sure. Um, but she was right, like, you know, the, um, this press took it and, and one of the places was a contest. It's, uh, uh, I think it's called DZ ANC or something, Donks, have you heard of that? It's a, a mid, um, it's a um, mid-career um, writer's uh, uh, fiction novelist uh, prize. So you have to have written, I think it, you have to have written three or four, maybe it's four books in order to apply for it. So I, I'd sent it into that. It has to be one that's not published that you send in. So I'd sent it in for that. And I was a finalist for that. And there were a lot of like really, you know, really great, I mean, some names I recognized on the list with, so I, I don't know, I felt good about it. And then they contacted me and said, um, oh, um, we'll, we'll find a, help you find a publisher. You know, we can probably help you find a publisher if you need for it. But I had already found, uh, I'd already heard from this place, um, University of West Virginia. I can't remember why I sent it to them. I think somebody, I did do some, I did use duotrope a little bit, but I, I, quite frankly, I didn't have that much time, and I, I think I found one place on that, uh, another press, and, and co coincidentally, right after I took this, I emailed them and said, you know, I've already gone, signed on with a small, other small press, and they said, Oh, we were just about to send you a letter saying we wanted to acquire it. So, I don't know. I guess that I, I just I guess that's just a long story to say that there that it was confirmation that what this editor Lorraine had been telling me was true. And and it was and I was kind of feeling really jaded, I think, about the whole book industry, so it made me feel good that there are legitimate um avenues out there for all of us. And that um, you know, when your book's ready, you'll be able to find um, a place for it. Um, the other thing I'll say about this is that um, it was very different working with these two um, different editors. So then here I am at this house that is, um, you know, by their own description of what what are they? What is this house? Oh, they're very. Um, they're they're literary. They're they're more interested in publishing something that's literary. So you know, oh, I'm not I'm not quite clear what they mean by that. I, everybody seems to have their own definition. But anyway, I start talking to this editor. Oh, first of all, what was different about the small press? I don't know if this is the same for all of them, but I have a couple other uh, writers that I know are publishing with small presses, and it was the same. It's the same for them. So it might be common. So I'll mention it might be helpful to know this. The way in which a small, the small press worked that was different than what I was used to is when I was with the major houses, all the feedback comes from this one editor, right? Well, at the small house, it was the main editor who gives you her feedback, but then they give it to a, a, some readers, outside readers. And this is through the University of West Virginia, and they have a pretty big MFA program, I think, there. So they, they have an MFA program. And so I think it went to a couple of the faculty on there. So anyway, I got these long letters from them, you know, like four-page single-space letters uh, of feedback. And I'd never experienced that before. So now I've got like three different things. And then I had to, my job was, and I only had like two days to do this or something, I had to take all three of those things and respond to what I was going to do with them and which things I was going to change and which things I wasn't in terms of a revision. And one of the letters was just pretty much this, this woman just, you know, a person just wrote everything was great and, you know, and why, and there were this, this little thing she wanted me to change. But then the other letter had all this stuff, you know, so I had to really think about it. And, and, and uh, so that was kind of interesting to get all this feedback. And then the other thing that was really interesting was, so I'm talking to the editor about it after getting all this feedback, and she's like, this ending has got to go. <laughs> you know, like, okay, like, I mean, why, you know, what is this? Jack and Elizabeth are getting married. You know, it was just so funny because she was like the exact opposite. And in the middle of this, where I'm like taking all this feedback going, yeah, yeah, well, I can get rid of this. Um, I get this email from my first editor, Lorraine, who I'm still emailing back and forth with. And she's so happy that I found this publisher, and 
she's saying, you know, I'll do whatever I can, Ladies Home Journal, which she did. She was great. And Women's Day, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll support the book, you know, I'll, whatever I can do. And you have to keep me informed. I can't wait to see what you do with it. And then she emails me P the, the e subject line, P.S. You know, I read the, whatever you do, don't drop that ending. <laughs> don't change a word of that ending, you know. And so it's like hard. So anyway, I ended up with the ending that the uh, other press, I, I, that was the other press. The other thing that was kind of a, a nice surprise um, is that the, um, I, I, you know, you have all these different copy editors. I, I really appreciate a good copy editor. And I had the best copy editor through the small press. And you know what? The, the, it was a graduate student who was doing an internship. And she's gone on to be an editor. I still get, I still get emails from her. And she was fabulous. And not just on the line of the, because uh, I even appreciate a good copy editor just for talking about syntax and punctuation and somebody who understands style. But she was great in terms of compression of the language. If any place wasn't quite clear for a reason or a word choice was slightly off, she had tons of stuff. She did, she did so much work on that book. And, and she was so great to work with. And uh, the editing process was really quick because they acquired the book in uh, January was when I had to write those letters. And then I had to be done with all of the edits by May, beginning of May. So usually, I think typically it's more like a year, but this was, was on a, it was, it was like six months. So um, I don't know if I have anything else that I've got down here. Do you have any questions you want to ask me? Yes. Um, the uh, mosaic reminded me of Homer Hickam's mother's mural. Oh, I haven't read that. Uh, it's, 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 uh, um, they're living in the coal mines, his father's a supervisor, and his mother's escaped from it all. There's this beautiful mural of Myrtle Beach where they have their honeymoon that she keeps working on. And at one point, the um, strikers shoot it out the window and it puts a hole in the mural. Oh, neat. But I thought the scene where the broken officer goes to the broken woman with the broken dishes to bring the wedding ring, and then the child cuts her foot, and he takes care of the foot, and she's also about glass, and he says, he will, he'll sweep it. Uh. But I thought that was the most beautiful scene, because mm -hmm. it had all the elements of brokenness and healing, and this, this voice of confidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, you know, and I, and I was saying this in, in my workshop this time because everybody in there had these sort of complicated um, plots and points of view and stuff. But I, and you know, a lot of people were working on uh, novels that had a few different storylines. But I think if you have a few different storylines or a few different points of view in your book, you know, one of the things you need to do is increasingly those stories need to, those lines need to cross. You need to find ways for them to intersect. <coughs> And you can, you can find this in any, uh, a, any, any book that does that well, examine it. It's interesting. You'll find the places where they cross are often, you know, have the potential for this great dramatic energy. And so that was um, one of my first early attempts to make those uh, storylines cross in some sort of a meaningful way in these two characters who hadn't known each other. Um, and um, yeah, the mosaic thing, I think that that partly come, I've, I have a sister who's a, uh, an artist, she's an art therapist, but also an artist, and she works a lot with, um, she does work with mosaics, and uh, you know, on a much smaller uh, level, like, you know, doing like small pieces around fireplaces or something like that. So that was like, I think, you know, where that image came from. And then again, the idea of, a, has always really appealed to me, of um, somebody who has a um, hobby that, and then it, then it becomes an, an obsession. Yeah. Was the drugstore ever rebuilt, like down the line? Yeah. Not as a drugstore. It was rebuilt, so even though they, yeah. they kind of said they didn't have the funding to rebuild it, so what would it end up becoming? Did you ever go see what it became, or was it like a little bit weird for you? I didn't go back. After we, we didn't live there very long, and I don't know if I went back. Um, I would live there a few years. 
for a long time it didn't went that in the, during the for probably even I think it might have been even up to 10 years it really was nothing they didn't build anything there um, and you know that's a good question what is it now I resisted going back I thought about because I was kind of traveling near there at one point and I thought oh I should just drive back past circle through circle you know through this place but I just I didn't because um, I don't know there was something that kind of uh, I just felt like it might mess me up or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, because I had the I had the town in my imagination, you know. Yeah, Mary. I wonder if the writing of the novel um, gave you any kind of personal resolution to the conflict you experienced early on. Did you have the dream again? No, it's funny I have. No, I have not had the dream. So maybe. I never really thought about it if I got a resolution. I mean, I just realized, like, like I was saying the other night, there's questions that never can be answered. Well, that was one of mine. I was kind of mad that my, when I first realized that I'm not gonna be able to answer this question. <laughs> but I think that ultimately, um, yeah, there must be some sort of resolution, even though I didn't ever feel like I had understood it really any better or much better. And yeah, I was wondering if you talk about um, scenes where the reverend is kind of counseling George or maybe not counseling George. <coughs> I think the dialogue is so interesting in those scenes because, especially when they're talking about about God and then you break it off and George asks, like, do you know what it takes to build a bomb? And then he starts singing it and there's so many different <laughs> levels to that dialogue and I, I wondered about your experience in writing those two characters in the office. Well, that was hard. I mean, I rewrote those sections a lot. I mean, I think that I think that it would. It took me a long time to get both of those characters and what they would say. Minister was hard too because you know, um, I didn't want him to be too to be predictable. Uh, and there was that whole question of does the minister would the minister like turn him in right away or whatever. I went back and forth in my mind on that. But um, I, what I did with that dialogue, uh, I know uh, that made a difference for me was I, I sometimes do this. Um, I split it up into monologues. So I wrote it, them each out as their monologues. And because, because that allows you, in a, in, a, in a dialogue like that where the two voices are really, really different, you, you have to do a few things, right? You have to have these two very different voices that might be on the same page, or in that case, their case, weren't on the same page a lot of the time. And then the other thing that you have to have is you have to have the, um, you know, the conflict that somehow or another is playing out between them. And these were two characters. I think the reason I did it, I'm just trying to think why did I do it that way, but I, I think the reason I did it that way was probably because that was an instance where these were two characters who weren't always communicating with each other. So it wasn't like, you know, they were hearing one another and then responding. So I think it was useful for me to really get to hear their voices, to sort of write them out as a rant, and then write the other one out and then try to put it together and work out the responses. So that there are places in the dialogue where the two of them are kind of going at it head on with each other. But then, like you said, there are these other places where George just says something sort of out of left field that doesn't relate to what the minister has said. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking about that scene, though, because those scenes were hard. Those were hard scenes to write. Yeah. When all this happened with the editors and the publishers and all that, did you, did you at any point just give up on the book? <laughs> you mean give up on trying to publish it, or what do you yeah. mean? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Did I give up? I can't remember. I, I think I've wiped it from my memory. I, um, <laughs> fortunately, I don't remember that. Um, it's hard to it's hard to do that. You're right, and you know, of course, it's it was devastating uh, to get that news. Um, I think it really helped me. Um, 
I think it always helps to have people that you're talking to about it. It really helped me to talk to the editor because she was like, yeah, I think about her. I mean, she's, they just all got fired right off the, you know, they had, out of nowhere. And so it kind of put it in perspective for me that mine was just one book. This was her life, you know. And then, and then it was so, so that was the first conversation I had with her that sort of like put it in perspective, getting the story from her. And then she was very generous in, you know, communicating with me and wanting to kind of keep, keep she kept pushing, you know, she, was, she would just email me again and say, have you done anything yet with it? And so I think that that helped me a lot was to have somebody, because I could sense in her emails and in her, when she called me, the couple times she called me, how much she believed in it. And I think that that made it a little more possible for me to um, believe it. But yeah, when I sent it out myself to those small presses, I thought, nothing's going to come of this. <laughs> I really didn't think anything would. I, I think that's probably why I only sent out to a few places, because I didn't expect it to go anywhere. I was kind of just doing it because she, she thought I should. I'll just sort of comment uh, or compare your experience with mine and, and answer to this question. Yeah. My first novel, um, I revised it a number of times since my agent. He tried to auction it, didn't didn't go in the auction, and finally Random House bought it. And it, the editor there, there, like your situation, really liked it. And then she took a job as a senior editor at, at HarperCollins. Uh. So she tried to bring the book. Well, it just at that time, HarperCollins was cutting 150 titles. Oh, boy. She needed to cut down. And I came into that you know, that vortex, and I was one of those. So uh, for three years, and Random House didn't want to publish the book because there was, no, there was nobody there who wanted, who was a supporter of it, okay, who was going to be the person ushering. If you have a fatherless you know, yeah. book at a place, it's, it's, it spells a death knell. So for three years, it just sat there. I went on to write my next book. Okay? Yeah. In the meantime, I got myself a lawyer, <laughs> and the lawyer looked at all, the, this is back in the early days of email, but mostly it was paper trail. He said, give me the paper trail. So I sent him all the paper trail. My argument was, it's going to hurt my career. They had promised they had already paid me, blah, blah, blah. And he sent a letter to Harper Collins. A week later, we said, your book will be out in October. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and I knew that they were going to just publish it and then wash their hands. And, and so I then did all sorts of stuff, and I really got behind it. I, I read review, I read interviews with people who published, self-published their books, or published in a small press, or even published in a large press. And I, for the year, I did everything imaginable. And that book went into eight editions, and first, first in hardback, and three editions in paperback. It won all sorts of awards, and, wow. and then suddenly they wanted me for the next book, and they gave me two book contracts. But that was the first thing. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. Was, for three years, I was in a funk. But I had to move on and write the next book. Okay, and, and sometimes it happens, and it's happened with short stories of mine. It had, you know. Yeah. Was, I thought it was. I thought it was the only author this ever happened to. And you find out it's very common. And what you have to do is you have to go on to the next book. Okay. You have to make sure that first book is good. And, and at some point, if, if nothing ever happened to it, I knew that first book was good. I would have sent it somewhere else on my own. I would have done exactly what you did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think that um, in some ways, the small press was just as, you know, because nowadays, you know, a lot of these bigger presses, this is where Lorraine was telling me this, and I think this is probably true. A lot of the bigger presses aren't doing that much publicity. You know, you're not getting as much marketing or publicity as you used to get. I mean, my first two, two books, especially my second book, they sent me all over the country on tour. I mean, they don't do that anymore, you know? And I remember it didn't happen with my third book, and that was where my editor didn't get behind it at all. And then, you know, the sales were, were not, I mean, it did come out in paperback and everything, and it got, got some really good, very good reviews, but the sales weren't great. And so, you know, I think that um, the small press, what I was impressed with is that they really did, and I was talking to Al about this actually this morning because he was saying his press does the same thing. They really did a good job of sending it out to get um, reviewed, like to a lot of places. They didn't kind of keep on them as much as they could have. I'm in a very, I was in a very good position uh, about, with this because I, in terms of publicity, because I have, there's a woman that I went to college with, and she was an English major. Well, she became a publicist. 
And um, she worked, she's done a lot of things, but she was for a while, she was with one of the bigger um, uh, publishing houses as a, as a publicist. And she got kind of sick of how they were doing things. So she, um, so she went out on her own and, and she's able to, um, to just freelance. And, but she's had all these really big clients, like she was the main publicist for a number of years. Uh, she got tired of doing that too, I think, with the, for the Bezos family, which, you know, they own Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so she's, she is really good. <laughs> and she, um, you know, she, she's just so nice and she loves my books. And she was like, you know, she wouldn't even, I mean, I took her, it's like ridiculous, I took her out to dinner a few times. I mean, she wouldn't let me give her any money for it. She just did all this extra work. So she sent out for me also, so that she, the publicist at the, at the small house, she was, the thing that was good about it was that this was a young woman and she was, instead of being territorial about it, which my friend was afraid she might run into, she said, yeah, I don't know how much I'll be able to use some of publicists are territorial. This woman was not at all. She was like, she was new to it. She was like, oh, I really want to learn from you. So they would do things like split lists. And anyway, I think the book got sent out to a few more newspapers and stuff that way. She sent it out to some awards. And, and I did get that uh, independent publishing award for fiction that year, which was great. Um, and, the, and that resulted in, um, I, I forgot to bring the stickers with me. But anyway, there are all these stickers that supposedly, I don't know, maybe, I, no, they don't seem to be putting them on the books. They're supposed to be putting the stickers on the books. Oh, you've got one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they put these little gold stickers on, that's supposed to help, help sales. Um, but I went to, a, I did a lot of readings. I, um, I was in Virginia as a writer in residence. Uh, right after it came out. So I also did a lot of readings in the South and in that kind of Midwest area. And I did, um, I, I did some at universities. Universities and colleges are very good places to read because you have a bigger, often get a bigger audience than you would in a bookstore. And I did um, Virginia Festival of Book, which is a really great book festival. Um, and they put you on a panel. You have to apply for it. So you have to send your book in and apply. And then, um, and it's really fun too, there's all these writers. And, and um, and you're there. You're on a panel, and then they and then people buy your book after that. And then and then what was great about that was that through that Virginia Festival of the Book, somebody who um, a writer down there who um, who works with one of the bookstores who runs a big book group. It's a large book group, like I don't know, 40 people or something. And she read my uh, book. Um, and then contacted me and said if she used it with her book group, would I talk with them? Which of course I would. <laughs> so then that was a great opportunity that um, I think I, it was like I did the panel one day and then the next day I did that, um, did that book group. So, um, so yeah, I tried to do uh, everything I could. Um, you do have to you know, I think, especially now, you, you really have to, a lot of this c comes down to um, maybe with the bigger houses too, but certainly with a small house, you s sort of, they were very willing to um, help me with the logistics, getting the books there, helping to set up the readings, but I had to make the initial moves. So I had to say, oh, you know, I'm gonna be so-and-so, uh, wonder if there's a bookstore, help, could, you help, could you email this bookstore? See if they, so I had to kind of take the um, initiative. And I've never had to do that before. I mean, always in the past, the publicist has just set it up and they send you this schedule and then you go do it. Um, but I had to come up with my own events and um, my own schedules and stuff. You're also having a panel on Sunday, Bill, Yeah. Well, that sounds good. So, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. You guys have a great audience. Tonight.